So what I want to really talk to you today is about how puppets can really help you in your ELSA work. And I want to make it clear from the outset that I'm not a puppeteer. I'm certainly not an expert in any way with puppets and I hope that will make you feel more comfortable. I'm just uh, an educational psychologist who has realised that puppets are very, very valuable in the work that we um, do with uh, children and that they have great relevance for ELSAs and I'm really, really sold on them. Now, I have used them in some of my work. I don't get to use them nearly so often now. Mostly, I find myself in a training role uh, and, and using them in that way. And um, I dare say that when you saw puppets on the programme, there will have been a mixed response. And some of you will have thought, oh, yes, great, I like puppets. And others will have thought, no, that's not for me. You won't get me using puppets. And especially if we have a few people here um, who work in secondary schools, where have we got some secondary people? Now, you may well be thinking, oh, no, well, puppet, this is, this is very primary. I hope that by the end of the session, you'll think differently about that. And, and I, I'll tell you up front that um, I have used puppets throughout the age range and actually would be very comfortable using them with adults. And the demonstration will show me using them with an adult because if we can use them successfully with an adult, then there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't use them with secondary age pupils. The thing is that we will use them differently according to the age of the young people or children that we are working with. The first time I used them at secondary was actually with an anger management group of year 10 and 11 boys. So that was a bit of a <laughs> baptism by fire. And I'll be honest with you, when I got them out, one or two of them said, oh, puppets, what do you think we're children? And I said, oh, well, that's okay. We can do this without the puppets. And I went to put them back in the bag. They said, no, 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 it's all right. You can leave them. And within a few minutes, of course, they all had puppets on their hands and, uh, and they were fine with them. And I have used them with other ages within secondary, uh, years eight, nine, around friendship skills, that kind of thing. I think that it's great to have a stock of puppets. Um, and we just need to think about when it's good to use them and uh, who might respond well to them. So my experience has mostly been using them in group work, but I have also used them individually with children. So why do I think it's really helpful for Elsas to consider using puppets? I think the main reason for me is that when you use a puppet, you can externalize sensitive issues. Now, you know that if we are going to talk about some life issues that perhaps are quite sensitive to us, our natural reaction is to get a little bit defensive. And there are things that we maybe don't really want to talk about or we perhaps try to deny because we're not comfortable with them. And you will have worked with children where you have tried to talk about some difficult issues in their lives and you've maybe met denial, some of you. Well, a good way of overcoming that is to take the focus right off the child or young person and to be able to externalize it so that in fact you'll be talking about the issues uh, as if they belong to somebody else. And that allows the person to look at them more objectively, which is much less threatening, perhaps, to uh, self-image, uh, to do it that way. So uh, the kinds of things that we can use puppets for in ELSA work is uh, to help children to understand emotions and use them to display uh, a lot of different kinds of emotions because um, with the puppets, we can use all kinds of facial expressions, and it, it makes it a lot more fun sometimes than just using pictures or just trying to model uh, facial expressions ourselves. I think they're also very useful for developing social skills. Uh, again, that's a little bit about um, externalizing the issues from the child and allowing the child to look objectively at a situation. 
In much the same way that you might use stories, you tell children stories that are relevant to the subject that you're wanting to cover, and you are hoping that they will identify with the characters in the story. And then maybe they will make some links for themselves as to how that also matches up with um, some of their issues. We can use them uh, to problem solve difficulties. Uh, we can use them in managing, um, helping children to think about managing angry feelings. And uh, we can use them to help children think about the important factors in developing uh, good and uh, uh, relationships with peers and what works in, in building friendships, what people like and what people respond badly to. So it's much clearer when we can help young people to look outside of themselves at some of those issues and then perhaps they can internalise their learning and put it into practice in their own lives. I did say to you that uh, one of the things that I've mostly used them for is um, anger management. For example, if I take a puppet like that, I, uh, we tend to think of the shark uh, not as a friendly creature at all, as quite aggressive. And, and, and if we think about, well, how does a, a, a shark, what sort of image do we have of sharks? I think most of us, if we were swimming in the sea and somebody shouted shark, we would bolt pretty quickly for the shore. We wouldn't be wanting to take chances because we think of sharks as uh, very physically aggressive. They're, they're very strong. They bite. They've got um, strong tails. Uh, you, you know, they can easily uh, you know, whip you uh, and, and damage you a lot with, with their tails as well as their teeth. We usually use, uh, in anger management, a range of maybe aggressive uh, puppets and um, contrasting puppets. So, for example, the snail here is, is great because, you see, when he's, when, when he's a little bit anxious, and I, and I think he may be a little bit anxious because there are so many in the room here, um, he can just withdraw. He may not be good news if you're a plant, but if you're a, another creature, uh, I don't think there's any creatures that he's going to threaten at all. I love the dragon. He's, he's, he's a fantastic uh, puppet, this one. And, and I think of him, for me, I suppose the, um, the, 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 the bit I notice particularly about the dragon is, is, is his mouth. And when we think of dragons, I know they're mythical creatures, but in the storybooks, I mean, they, they breathe fire, don't they? So it's all about what comes out of their mouths. Well, you can already begin to see where I'm going with this, I think. Those sorts of children who are very verbally aggressive, they swear a lot, they get very angry verbally, and there's a lot uh, you know, coming out of, their, out of their mouths all the time. But what's the effect of that? Well, if we think about the dragon and we think about stories of dragons, they're not, they're not very social creatures. In most of the stories, you get one dragon who's terrorizing a village or something like that. You know, people are really afraid of the dragon. And, and so the, the effect, if you like, of that very aggressive behavior is to alienate people. And you can see how you can draw some metaphors for children. Um, and, and, and actually, you know, we, we could work around how we could make the, how we could help the dragon. If we were working with younger children, how could we help the dragon to make friends? What do we need him to do? What would make it feel okay to play with the dragon? And, and, and perhaps we can get a contrasting puppet. And I, I have sometimes used, paired up something like, say, a dragon and, and the mouse. The mouse is a very uh, timid little creature here. He's some um, He's, he's really quite cute. Most people think of the mouse as quite cute. I, I, I know you might not think they're cute if one suddenly runs across your kitchen floor, but mostly when we see mice, we think, ah, it's got that ah factor, hasn't it? So we could do, have two children, one with a mouse, one with a dragon or a shark, and get them to do a role play about how the, the mouse teaches the shark um, to behave in a different way so that he's comfortable to be friends with it. And there's a lot of learning that can, can go on with younger children like that. I've certainly done that at primary 
um, age. In fact, I think I've done that also with uh, younger um, key stage three pupils. Obviously, the way that you present it's just slightly talking in a slightly uh, more adult way. If you're thinking about, for example, anger management, uh, you could ask them to think about these puppets and is there a puppet that you think is quite like you? So let's take the bee, for example. They're, 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 somebody might pick the bee and, 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 and feel that they're quite like the bee. And then you would want to explore, well, what is it about the bee that they're like? And if we think about the bee in terms of anger management, there's, there's a bit of a problem about the bee when he gets very angry. If he gets really angry, what does he do? He stings. What's the consequence? Death. So it's not a great strategy for him to use. <laughs> and, and, and perhaps we can liken the bee a little bit to, to children who, who just every now and then have a really major outburst and end up getting themselves into all kinds of, um, of problems. I think we also have to be very careful when we're using these, uh, these puppets not to, to too quickly put our own interpretation on them, but to see what they mean for others. So, for example, I was working in a, a supervision group of adults and I took along some puppets because we were revising how you could use puppets. And I asked a lady there to choose, if she would like to choose a puppet to... Um, that maybe reminded her in some way of her husband. I know that's probably a dangerous question. <laughs> and she picked the mouse. Well, straight away, my mind was sort of saying, oh, so she must be married to quite a mousy little man, you know, maybe quite timid and ineffectual. You see how you're, you have your own interpretations. Thankfully, I didn't put that upon her in any way, and I didn't ask a direct question, oh, is he very timid or is he very shy? And I said to her, so, so what is it about a mouse then that um, makes you think about your husband? And she said, well, mice are really curious creatures. They're absolutely into everything. They're interested in everything. And that's really like my husband. And I thought, well, that was something I'd never thought about myself, about the mouse. But you see how you need to be very careful about not interpreting for somebody else because you might have the wrong interpretation. You may be thinking some of these puppets, especially these ones that I've shown you, are, are perhaps very expensive. And some of them are, you know, I guess the dragon is pretty, pretty expensive, some of these bigger puppets. However, one of my colleagues found recently that there are sort of equivalent puppets that retail at only a few pounds. Some of them are, are very, very cheap. And I never actually go to any school without this one. He, he lives in my bag. Um, I have to say, uh, he doesn't come out a lot. But he does come out often if, I, if I'm in an infant school and working with um, young children or perhaps lower age, junior, or I might, especially if I worked with a shy child. And the problem in our role is that we go in and um, we're asked to go and work with a child. Maybe, maybe we've been doing some observation first, so we don't really want to know the child to know that we're there watching them. Um, and so it's a bit of a surprise to them when we go up to them and say, would you like to come out and work with me? So sometimes I found it very helpful to go up and, and, and just quietly start playing with my little mouse and, and you see how you can really make him come to life in there. And I talk about how he's really very, very shy and nervous. But, you know, if you talk to him, and he's called Squeak, if you talk to him gently, you, you might be able to coax him to just come out and he gets a little bit curious and then maybe the child begins to stroke him. See, that's very simple. All we've got is it's on the middle finger laying in the palm of the hand, the other hand, a little home over it, and 
he really feels almost real, doesn't he? And I, I, I find him, him great. And, and then that really breaks the ice with, with children, and they start to get very interested in him. And if I've got to do some very boring assessment work, that went, well, maybe Squeak would like to sort of watch them and, and, um, and, and sit there and watch what they're doing. And we give Squeak, uh, Squeak a little bit of a character there, and that adds interest to the session. I have actually taken um, this, this, this is, most of these do not belong to me, but I will confess that Sebastian is mine. Um, I'm, 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 I, I bought him, I just couldn't resist him, actually. And I have taken him uh, to me. It did backfire on one session when I was assessing a child because I, I sat him um, on the chair at the table and brought the child in, and then only to discover that the child was a bit scared of puppets. <laughs> <laughs> So the, the nice thing about these big puppets, these ones are really meant only for um, adult use because they're too big, really, for children. But uh, you don't have to. In using puppets, you do not have to be a ventriloquist at all. I never try to do that. It would be, in fact, if I tried to do a ventriloquist act for you, you wouldn't look at the puppet at all. You'd be looking to see if my, my mouth was moving, and it would be. Uh, but the point is, with a puppet, it's more to do with the, uh, the way you move them, really. And they can take on a character of their own. Do you mind? It's a bit rude. Put your mouth, <laughs> put your mouth when you're yawning. And that you can give them a character of their own. You could talk with a, a child, and the child would really be focused on the puppet like that. And, and it's lovely with a puppet like this, the kind of expressions, you know, he can, be, he can be very, very happy and animated and excited. He can also be a little bit shy and nervous. Um, he, he, he can get very nervous at times, actually. I can see that you're having an impact on him now. And uh, uh, yeah, I know, you haven't been in a room with so many people before, have you? But. Um, uh, we also we we can give them a voice if we want to, and we don't have to we don't have to make it uh, a, a particularly different from our own. The thing with a puppet like this is that if I got him to talk to me, I've just got to think about how I move his mouth and that it goes in sync with the words. So um, if I asked him, Sebastian, have you had a good day today? Um, yeah, okay. So what did you do? Um, hmm. <laughs> I can't remember. See, it's not very difficult to give him a little bit of a, a, a life. With, um, certainly with uh, primary age children in particular, they will really enter into puppet play. And you can have a puppet in there that you can build up a whole character around and they will so believe it. So one thing you've got to be careful about with puppets is, is how you treat them. You see, if I, um, what you would never do is just sort of take him off and fling him on the ground, you see? Uh, well, you see that? Oh, you, you see, you're hooked, aren't you? I mean, that's just a terror. Well, perhaps you'd like to look after him. Would you imagine <laughs> toss him around? So, uh, and... Um, Oh, I was going to show you this character. This one is called Citizen Sid. Have, some of you have got Citizen Sid, have you? Citizen Sid is a mole, and he comes with his own book, actually, which is... Uh, um, it's, it's even got some songs in there, but uh, on, a, on a CD. But there are a lot of stories in there, stories about kinds of issues that children might have in their lives. And it's about Citizen Sid and his, um, his family uh, and, and some of the issues he faces in his family and in his friendships and uh, um, telling the truth and some of those subjects. And telling children stories like that and, and having a puppet to relate to is very much more powerful than just having a book. Uh, and you will probably think a little bit more about that on your last day when you do therapeutic stories, because I think what I'm describing about puppet work has a big overlap with the whole use of therapeutic stories. Here is one I prepared earlier. See, all it takes is a couple of eyes and a mouth and we could get all kinds of expression. In fact, it reminds me of an Elsa that I, I do work with uh, in, an, in an infant school. She, made, she used some socks and made uh, 
made what she called worry worms. And um, she would get the children to uh, use worry worm. And, and uh, for example, if they were going to go on a school outing, that was one I remember, um, and she sensed that a child was a little bit anxious about that, she gave him worry worm and said, look, worry worms really worried about going on the outing to the zoo tomorrow. What do you think worry worm is worrying about? Now, I don't recall what came out, but it could be something like, he might be frightened that he's going to be sick on the bus. Uh, th what that illustrates is that when you ask children, if you like, to talk to you or, um, uh, or put themselves in the place of a, a puppet, there will be always something of them which comes out. So sometimes puppets are a very, very useful way of getting to uh, some of those underlying issues that children aren't ready to talk about, or maybe they're not, not even particularly conscious of, but puppets will cause them to come to the surface or near enough to the surface that it makes them accessible to you. Put the owl back. <laughs> One other of, um, of, of my, well, I actually, no, I have a few of my own here, but uh, I've got one that I bought years ago, uh, I, and I just like this character. Um, you wouldn't actually do it like I'm doing it now for you with children. You would put a bit more mystery around it, and you don't show them, you, you know, shove it on your hand in quite such an unceremonious <laughs> way as I do. But your puppet doesn't have to actually talk. This one, actually... Has a, has a squeak that, that, that he could talk to me and I could interpret for you what he says because I'm very gifted in that way. And <laughs> speak now. Yeah. You, the, what? There was somebody over there who was doing what? Oh, well, I'm not going to say because that would be just too embarrassing. But thank you for telling me. Uh, you can see how you could use that with groups of children and get them they really get their attention and uh, uh, and get them listening. So um, that's a little bit of a, a warm up of various ways in which you can use puppets. Oh, uh, uh, one thought that came to me in infant school. How many of you are from infant schools? Do you have have you ever seen this done? Maybe having a class puppet that um, has its own little suitcase and goes home to stay with the yeah. children. Okay, can you tell me how you, how, how you use it in your school? Anybody tell me how you, how you use we that? We have a bear which goes home with a person who's perhaps performed well during the week or has done something that they haven't been able to do before and they take a diary with them and he stays with them for the weekend. Right. They take a camera and they take a photograph of it doing an activity and then it comes back on the Monday and they read the account to the rest of the class and then it's there for the next person the next week. Excellent. So that bear has really got a character and a life of, of his own in that class. Now, you can see how you could easily get a child who was having some problems with a certain aspect of social skills, maybe, and they could take that bear home and teach him some manners or teach him how to, how to um, eat nicely at the table or, or um, uh, how to um, ask politely for things and not interrupt and you could you could build up a persona around that puppet that having those difficulties and maybe they're difficulties that the child has and you want the child to think about and you ask the child to go away and keep the diary and um, see how uh, see how the bear gets on and come back and report on it and and in that way the child may be internalizing some very important social skills learning without you having to say you know when you go to the table you should do this and you should do that which is not a great way of teaching children it's often the way that we choose but it's less effective than when we help them to internalize the rules through that kind of way Okay, I think I we're going to go now into a uh, demonstration. And for this, uh, this uh, I want to do this bit in particular because I feel for those of you working in secondary, this is something that would be very powerful 
uh, for, for you. It doesn't mean that you couldn't work with it at a younger age group as well, but I felt it was very important to put something in that's really useful and relevant and usable with older age groups. Okay, Rebecca, so I wondered if perhaps today you would like to uh, use any of the puppets that we've got here and think a little bit about your friendship circle and uh, because after our immediate family, probably the most significant people often in, in, in our lives that have a, uh, the most impact are the people that we mix with day to day on a friendship basis. So perhaps you'd like to explore some of your uh, friendships and tell us about some of the people. So have a good look at the puppets. Take your time and uh, okay. see what springs to mind. Yeah, okay. let's start with this one. <laughs> so would you like to uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the friend that the dragon is representing? Yeah. Um, um, she's a very angry person. Right. And um, that's expressed verbally uh -huh. a lot of the time. Um, she's recently gone through a um, but is still very angry, very angry and bitter. So we hear a lot as friends, we hear a lot from here. I'm just wondering how that impacts upon you as a, a group of friends. I think uh, initially people were a bit scared um, of what came out of here. Um, if we think about you for a moment, mm -hmm. when you're with this particular friend, I wonder if there's a, a puppet here that would represent maybe how you tend to feel. I mean, maybe you'd like to put mm. that one down on the table for now. Actually, can I put her down there? Yeah. Because she often talks about kind of going into a black hole and um, and a wall goes up right. so putting her down at least kind of I think puts her in a place where she when she's angry that's where she wants to be okay she shuts herself away in a sense from her friends okay so if you'd like to think about uh, for you when you are with her how you're feeling. Oh, that's hard. I think this is what I try to be with her. So I, I try to be the wise owl. Um, who listens and I suppose tries to help and advise her. Mm. I think there are other times when I might do more of this and actually hide away from it. Because there's only so much you can hear and listen to and advise mm. where it comes a point where actually you just need to go away mm. and leave them alone. Something that struck me when you put the owl down there was the, the kind of, I, I don't know whether it's relevant for you at all, but the size imbalance for that little wise owl and this big problem. I think she's a big character among our group of friends mm -hmm. and it's been a big problem for her. And it's actually become a big problem. It's been such a shared problem, mm -hmm. um, not necessarily by people's choice, but certainly by her choice. Mm -hmm. 
So it's kind of been, in a sense, forced upon others. So it's become a group problem where the discussions have always been around that. Right, OK. So let's hear a little bit about some of the other friends and maybe okay. uh, uh, how this impacts them. Oh, I think I know. I know who this is. This is Pauline. Her nickname's Bouncer. All right. <laughs> so Tigger seems to be an appropriate one for her. And um, she always puts on a happy face. Uh -huh. And she's very bouncy. Very bouncy, very energetic. Where would you like to put um, Pauline? I'll just put her here for now, I think. Looking over on. Okay. Looking over that one. Um, the caterpillar. This one's Joe. And Joe presents as being quite quiet in the group, um, always calm, but I think <coughs> there's more to her than meets the eye. Mm -hmm. I think she's a beautiful person, and clearly this becomes a beautiful person, doesn't it? Which one would you like to leave there representing you? Because at the moment we've got two. Shall we take one of those away? Okay, so I'll take the bigger one out of the way. Shall I take that from the way? Thank you. you. Put Joe here. Okay. And I think I've... In fact, this friend's going through a, a separation. Right. Um, seems to be the flavour of the year. Um, so I'd like to think that I've been kind and listening I noticed that you've Towards her. put her right next to you mm. there and, in fact, touching, really. And I, would, I noticed that you said that for some people uh, she's a butterfly, some people see that and maybe others don't. So I'm sensing that perhaps that's something that you've seen and it has drawn you closer, maybe? I think it probably has. I think over the last few months we've certainly become closer. Hmm. Okay. Are there one or two more in the, it, that should be here in the group? Yes. Um. <laughs> this one. This is Mandy. This is definitely Mandy. And um, Mandy is kind of the very sensible one, actually. Right. She's, um, she has got big curly hair. Um, she's also quite a big character, but in a much quieter way in the group. Um, She could, she could actually be, in, be an owl too, yeah. um, in that she's, she speaks great words of wisdom and uh, always brings a sensible, doesn't she? Sensible comment to, and perspective to things when they get a bit difficult. Um, and she's great with children. Fun person, but, but very calm and very helpful and very... Um, unselfish. What do you think it was about that particular, because we've got a number of puppets there that are, that are, are characters, I, I think she's not the only female. What was it about that one that made you think particularly of Mandy, do you think? I think partly the hair. 
although she looks quite strained there, and that's not how Mandy would look. We need to open her up a bit, because she's much, a much happier person than that. But there's something simple about her as well, in the sense of Mandy's not a dressy person, um, she's not flamboyant, she's quite, quite simple and presents herself mm. in a quite a simple way. I don't mean plain and dull, but just simply presented and quite casual as a person. So I think that, for me, is why I chose her. Mm. So where does she belong in the group, do you think? I think she tries to look over everyone, in a sense. I think, in a way, she's always keeping an eye out for everyone, so I'd kind of like to put her somewhere there. I don't know if she'll stay. She's staying? <laughs> Just about. <laughs> Just about staying there. Okay. So is that it, or do you think we've missed anybody that really needs to be there? I'm sure there are other friends, but... Um. Yes, there is definitely s at least one other person that sh or two that should be there. And I think I'll take this one. This is for Jay. And she's a very busy person. She works for the university in research. She has two children. She's part of the WSA, which is the school association, parent-teacher association. So she's helping with fireworks displays, with cake sales, with setting up Christmas fairs. And she's part of this, very much part of this friendship group as well. Um, and, and quite a busy, quite lively person. So I have a sense of her as sort of really buzzing around all over the place within the group. Is there any place in particular that she might belong more um, than? She's kind of busier outside the group than in it. Right, OK. Um, and actually won't, won't necessarily interfere with things going on in the group, but is busy outside, but is very close friends. I'll put her here. Very close friends with Bouncer. Um, they practically had their children together and raised the younger okay. ones together, so they're very close. All right. Mm. Okay. So, uh, are we? Are you happy to leave it there, or is there yep. anybody missing that should be? Th there's another person in my mind. Well, let's go for the other person. In your One mind. other person, but I'm not sure if I can. She's hard. I'm going to come back to this one. I think there's a cultural cultural image here that that's that is the one th link I could think of to mm -hmm. associate with this friend um, she's actually Russian uh -huh. she's not Indian but I couldn't find anything that reminded me of that there um, and she looks slightly worried actually <laughs> to me and I think that she she has a richness of her culture that she brought with her from Russia to this country, which she holds dearly. But at the same time, she's had a lot of worries, um, an awful lot of worries. Her mum was very ill and died recently. Um, but the group, as a group member, she's relatively newer, um, but has been very much included as a friend and I think has taken great support from everyone. And perhaps we've helped some of those worries a little bit along the way to help us smile a bit more. Mm. So that would be her. OK, where would you like to put her? Um, I, think, I think about here. Because she's, she's also clo becoming quite close to this friend. Okay. And they help each other a lot. Whoops. And what Interest I noticed there, now that you've got your group of, of friends there, yeah. I'm interested about where you are. <laughs> In the middle of the whole mess. <laughs> um, I wonder if that's where I really am or whether I like to be. I think I do dip in, in a sense, in the middle, because I have different connections and different relationships within that.
there was a lot of emotion in it for me and I was um, quite conscious of trying to manage that actually, with, especially when thinking about particular friends. Um, I think, you know, the, the first one, the, the dragon and the butterfly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Elena. Um, because I was very aware that they're kind of both in very difficult places. And what I found myself doing was thinking quite intensely, actually, about their own circumstances at the moment and how they are as people, but then how I am with them as well. So you go through quite a deep, quite a deep process of thinking about that person, but also in ways that perhaps I wouldn't have thought about them before, actually. So it, it gives you some reflection time. So could you think of an example of something that you shared with us that was directly stimulated by what you were holding in your hand and looking at? I think, I think the butterfly. Yes. That, that was originally the caterpillar and how you can see it's developmental isn't it a, a butterfly and that it goes through certain phases and, of life if you like for me that friend is very much going through stages at the moment so I think I had I did some thinking about her in a way that I hadn't before right okay so things that stood out to you what you noticed yeah, we've got a great understanding of all your friendships and perhaps how you cope with things and see people and empathise with them. Mm. I thought as well, uh, eye contact, the yes. eye contact that you had was towards the puppets rather than oh. to each other, so there was no, you know, you weren't being um, face on to each other at all, you were focusing on the puppets much more, so it took away any nervousness that way, I suppose, with dealing face on to each other. Yeah. It's interesting to wait and say what aspects of that particular animal speak to you and yes. whether there's links between your own experiences of that particular animal. I have a person who loves rats, who's a friend of mine, she's a delightful lady, but quite often she walks around with a rat on her shoulder when I visit her at her house and my reaction to the rat and her reaction to the rat are completely different. Yes. So it's just interesting to see what characteristics you actually put onto the animal which then relate to your friends. So it's nice to have that openness of choice there. Yes. In some respects, using the more human puppets seemed to be a little bit more constraining. It was actually, definitely. It took me longer to, yes. to think through the, the possible similarities. Right, so, mm. so that's perhaps an illustration why it's so useful to have such a wide range and, and particularly to have perhaps um, a, a, a lot of animal puppets. Maybe that's why I've gone for such a large animal collection more than, more than people. Other comments? You didn't have to drag any explanations or answers out at first. She was much freer in giving the information to you and being forthcoming with what she felt. Yes. Yeah. I didn't sit here thinking about what am I going to ask Rebecca next. I could sit here and just relax and watch and listen for what came. Mm -hmm. And that I think is very different when you're using puppets or other objects rather than just sitting and talking. My sense and why I'm so uh, um, committed really to this kind of work is that I think it does bring out things that are not, it, it brings out much richer information than you get from just a straightforward conversation. And it just reminds me of a little girl who was probably about six at the time that I was asked to uh, become involved and do some assessment of her. And she had a very troubled background. But the biggest insight I got from her was when I was playing with uh, puppets and uh, I think dolls and, and encouraging her to play with them and just being a part of that. And um, I can't remember now whether it was, she was very fond of, of the mouse, whether it was the mouse or whether it was a doll. But what I noticed with her she would be very, very maternal, very sort of sweet with it. But then suddenly she picked it up and she went, you little sod! Mm -hmm. And that told me more in that few seconds than 
anything else I, I had done with her.